Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us. I'm Deirdre Mendez. I'm the director of the Center for Global Business, and uh, we have such a wonderful uh, presentation for you this evening. Um, I couldn't be more excited about this one because um, uh, what Tyann Osborne is here to tell us this evening is um, uh, some of the, the, the things that I love best and the most fascinating so um, Ty, welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Deirdre. I'm so excited to be with y'all. Um, I will introduce uh, you very briefly, but I also want to um, begin with a disclaimer that you are ill and <laughs> joining us in spite of that and that you have, uh, that if you need to um, um, cough convulsively or whatever, we will per we'll absolutely understand um, but in any case, um, uh, what you have to say is uh, is so fascinating that I can't wait to hear it again. And I know everyone else will uh, will enjoy um, what you have to say. Um, for those of you who have not yet read her bio, Tyann Osborne has spent her career, much of it anyway, enabling business leaders and managers and employees. Um, to improve their business performance and effectiveness through innovative professional development and strategic talent solutions. Today, she's working with organizations to provide training and speaking. She's speaking and coaching in the areas of strengths-based performance, leadership development, and organizational effectiveness. Prior to launching her practice in 2012, I was the global director of human resources for the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, an organization which you may know has an endowment of more than $2 billion dedicated to improving the lives of children in urban poverty. She also has held executive and global leadership positions for Dell, PepsiCo Food Services, and CSC Consulting. And she's had exciting and very interesting uh, expatriate assignments in Bangalore, India, and Shanghai, China. She has a BBA in economics and management from Baylor University and an MBA from St. Edwards University. So I am delighted to welcome Tyann Osborne. And once again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Deirdre. Appreciate it. So uh, I will launch right into my questions. And then as we usually do with these presentations, we'll take uh, questions from uh, the group in the chat. And I know we're going to have a lot of those because you have such great stories. So where I would like to start uh, is with something that we discussed in the past, which is that there can be discontinuity between expectations that uh, an expatriate manager or uh, someone who's sent abroad on a even temporary assignment mm -hmm. um, and uh, may have uh, between that person's expectations and the expectations of the people in the destination regarding uh, your role and uh, your work. So if you're an expatriate on assignment, you'll have a certain set of expectations that come to you from the home office Yes. Or if you're starting a new job for a foreign company, you might have certain expectations based on your education or your experience in your home country, your uh, work experience in previous positions, et cetera. So can you, first of all, start by giving us some examples of ways in which these expectations might differ between what you've experienced at home and where you're headed now? Absolutely. So this is something I wish I had known or someone had given me some explicit advice on before I just hopped on a plane and then showed up on the other side of the world. I thought by the time an expat assignment had been approved, because it's an expensive proposition to send somebody abroad, and especially if you're going to be there for quite some time. And so I thought by the time that had been approved, all I would have to do is just show up and say, hey, everyone, I'm Ty, I'm here to help. And uh, that was not the case. <laughs> That's not what happened at all. So I would say you really need to start by asking a lot of questions and not making assumptions. This is something that I wish I had done in terms of not just speaking with my immediate manager in the home office, 
but then asking, I always love this question now asking who else should I speak with about this and whoever they tell you to speak with, follow up with that person, because what you're trying to do is create a success team. You, you don't want to feel like you're out there on the moon all by yourself. You want to feel like you have a team that's supporting you. So I would start with a home office then, and then I would say, okay, who's important for me to get in contact with in the destination location? Because it's not always when you're looking at an org chart, it's not always clear. And then there's, you know, as we know, there's position power and then there's influencing power. And there can be a lot of channels behind the scenes that might not be apparent if you're just looking at something on the surface. So I would get in touch with those people as soon as possible and ask, as opposed to saying, you know, I'm coming over and I have my agenda, I would then ask, what would a successful assignment look like to you? What are the things you can recommend that I do? Who else should I talk with? And so by the time you actually arrive in country, you have your success team created in your home office and your destination office. And I'll tell you a quick, funny story. Um, you know, coming out of business school and I worked at Dell for quite some time, um, I could put together a Gantt chart like nobody's business. You know, that's one of those things that we look at, right, in terms of project management. Mm -hmm. And I had this whole thing laid out when I first showed up in Bangalore. And let mm -hmm. me tell you, things mm -hmm. that don't matter for a thousand, Alex, is a Gantt chart from your home office that has no input from the destination office. I should have thrown that out the window and start it over. So if that was, you know, looking for advice, I would tell my younger self is definitely don't create your project plan in a vacuum and ask instead of tell. Uh, so I think that I, I love that. I love ask instead of tell. And maybe uh, asking in the home office questions like, so uh, who have we talked to about this right. uh, in the destination office? And has this been confirmed with them? And have they are they the ones who have re requested this outcome or right. whatever to kind of probe a little bit and make sure you know whose agenda you're actually pursuing, right? When they tell you. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I had that happen where again, I thought by the time it had been approved, you know, both sides were on board, only to find out that something was really more of a home office initiative that was not requested by the destination office. And so again, if someone shows up who they really didn't ask for, and especially you're a little bit younger and you show up with, hey, I'm here with all the answers, um, that doesn't go over so well. And it's much harder to remediate kind of a, 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 you know, a start that isn't great than to go in and build a start that is great. So I think the idea that you have to step off the plane and immediately go into your project plan, I really wish I had realized some of those cultural elements too that make a difference. And you know, if you're working in America for a hyper-American country, um, they might be all focused on execution and efficiency. Mm -hmm. But a lot of other places in the world are not focused on execution and efficiency right off the bat. They're more concerned about building a strong relationship and then because we have a strong relationship, we can work together. Otherwise, it's like, I don't know you. I didn't ask for you to be here. And I don't really see how you're going to help me. Okay, I love that. So what are some of the questions? Um, uh, you started down that path, but um, just can you give us any an idea of some more? Uh, what are the kinds of questions you want to ask when you first start meeting with people? So well, I like to start now with what's your pain point? You know, what are the things that are causing you trouble? And in the destination location, I like to ask now, is there anything you wish you knew about the home office or communication that you could get from the home office? Or is there someone that you would like to be in contact with? Because um, you're really trying to find out how you can help them, not how they can bend to your Gantt chart. And so really that ask, because I guarantee whatever they say is not going to be what you expect. And that might actually look a little different than what the home office was sending you over there to do. But when you look at it, it's it's not the you show. It should be how can you add value to them, which in turn adds value to the whole company. So I really like that asking for people's pain points and then starting from there and seeing, okay, you know, what are your issues? 
what are my skills and experiences that I can bring to the table? And then how can those things overlap? I always like a good Venn diagram. So I'm looking for the overlap in that. Um, I love that. And um, partly because also it helps position you as a person who's interested in maybe being a bridge uh, between them and the home office, right? Which can often be, uh, they can all often feel the, a lack of a bridge, right? A hundred percent. That's such a valuable thing that you can offer, especially when you're um, more junior in your role, or maybe you feel like you don't have a ton of skills yet. You can offer to be that communication bridge. Um, being in India, you know, being in China, you're 11 and a half to 13 hours ahead of the U S right. And so oftentimes it's not very easy to make a phone call if during the middle of the day, if you need to understand something better, or by the time you send off an email, it's going to be a whole nother day before you get a response. And so there could be, and there often are when I ask real disconnects between, you know, what people think is happening and what's actually happening. And often the, the destination location will feel like they are not supported that well. Or maybe they don't feel like they know what's going on or they're in at the end of the line for communication. And so that's really a, a value add play that you can make um, right off the bat. I love that. And so kind of as a follow on, how do you get people to trust you? Well, I'll tell you, Deirdre, it's not by showing up with a Gantt chart and then saying, you know, here's, <laughs> here's what you're going to do for me. And so it's very much, you know, put yourself last, really be in a position of, I want to listen. So I need to talk to people. I need to really listen to what they're saying and then really spend time on building those relationships. Again, coming out of kind of a hyper American environment, we might give meetings with other people um, just not as much importance as you'll see in the destination location where it really is much more about building a relationship over time. And so I, I wish I had known that and really had built in that time for myself, as opposed to feeling like, I don't have time for four meetings today with people that I don't know if this is going anywhere. It's like, no, it's definitely going somewhere. And the investment you can put up front is really going to help you then start to make progress on that, um, whatever the project is. But I really wish I had spent that time up front developing relationships. And then again, whoever you meet with, ask, who else should I talk to about this? I have never had someone say, oh, well, there's no one else. Invariably, they'll say, oh, well, you really need to meet Rajesh because he's in, he's actually in charge of all this stuff, even though you might know it. He's the one who can help you get things done. And um, so that's my advice. Just ask, start building those relationships. And again, one thing you can do is always think about how can I not just be perceived as a taker? How can I be perceived as a giver? And so anytime I have a meeting with someone, um, especially when I'm in those early stages trying to establish a relationship, follow up with them with an email after your meeting saying, it was so great to meet you. These are the three key things that we talked about or I took away. Can I help you by doing X, Y, and Z? Can I help you by... Um, you know, taking notes? Can I help you by jumping in on this project? Can I help you make a connection to someone? And then, you know, anytime you can provide that as a, as a summary, and then maybe even a resource, this is something I do all the time. I'm a big learner. And so I like to always say, um, oh, Hey, you know, we were talking about whatever, here's an article I just read from HBR that was great on this very topic, or here's a podcast that I listened to who, you know, that was great. So thank them, the summary, and then see if you could give them a resource as well. And I found, you know, that goes a long way. That goes a, t a long way and really helps position you again as I, I want to learn, I want to help, and I'm here to support you. I love all that. Okay. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going <laughs> to stick to the ones I wrote down because I want to be sure that we get those answered so that everyone else sure. can ask uh, theirs. So um, uh, how about this one? Uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier. Um, if you've been given a home office agenda or a schedule that doesn't fit with your destination, how do you, try, how do you strike a balance between serving both of them? 
Oof. And this is a good one. And this is kind of one of those life lessons to realize that the home office agenda might not be the same as, and probably won't be the same as the destination agenda. And you don't want to get caught in the middle. So a couple of things, you don't want to be the whiner. You don't want to be the complainer. And you certainly don't want to be seen as stirring up trouble. You want to be seen as helping facilitate solutions. Okay. So if those things don't match up, my first thing I always like to say is the psychic method doesn't work. And so just feeling internal turmoil about whatever is not solving the problem, hoping it works out. Hope is not a plan. So the psychic method doesn't work. You really need to especially start reaching out to people then and saying, um, here's what I'm seeing. You know, there, maybe there's less VIN in this diagram than I was um, expecting. Here's what I'm seeing. You know, here's a couple of solutions I can come up with. What do you suggest that we do? And so again, you're coming to the table with a solution. You're, um, you know, letting people know ahead of time that things aren't quite as aligned as you'd like. You're asking the right questions, but just hoping and not saying anything is not the right answer. And so there's always multiple ways to get to a resolution. And I would just say, you know, be open to those things. Um, you know, we were talking, Deirdre, about uh, the first rule of improv is yes and, right? So be the yes and person as opposed to the no person. No shuts things down, but yes and allows for new possibilities. But yeah, you're probably going to find that agendas do differ. I love that. And I love your, um, I love your comment about asking, what do you suggest? Because yeah. a lot of times the solutions that someone can offer in another location, you can't imagine what they would be because you don't know exactly. about that environment. Exactly. Yeah. And again, as a, especially as a junior person who's joining the team, I mean, your perspective of the world is, is kind of like this, and there's so much happening that you haven't been exposed to yet. So just asking those questions is a great way to, again, position yourself as a solution and a helper. Okay. I'm, I'm loving all of this. Okay. Um, I'm taking notes. Glad we're recording. <laughs> um, one of the things that I know um, our students are particularly interested uh, in is how they might figure out uh, how appropriate it is for them to make a contribution. In some places, you know, sadly, young people are expected to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. So how would a young, pe a young person um, go about figuring out uh, how to navigate that and what kind of contribution um, could they or should they perhaps try to make? Okay, Deirdre, this is again, things I wish I had known earlier in my career. I think when you are brought up in sort of the uh, American um, school system, and then especially by the time you've gone through, you know, you've been in the business school, you've been doing these things, um, we might have a tendency to just, we think we're expected to jump in right away. And I had a boss one time at Dell. And the first thing he told me was, um, you need to have a point of view, because if you don't have a point of view on things, then why did I hire you? And so that was very much the don't hesitate, jump in, say something in every meeting, you should say something and that kind of approach. Well, then knowing um, now, you know, what I know about destination locations is if somebody new and especially junior just comes in and starts saying again, hey, I'm so and so you should just listen to me, that might step on some cultural toes. Um, and so, you know, I found going into China, I was actually a little more senior by that point, And I had a large team in Shanghai. I was expecting a real collaborative meeting style because that's what I had come from only to find out that they were expecting I was the boss and I was just there to tell them what to do. And they couldn't have an opinion. Let me tell you, that took a little bit to figure out and figure out how we could all feel comfortable in moving a project forward. And so these are things I like to ask. What do you think my um, my approach should be in meetings? Do you is it a meeting environment where I should have something ready to say, or am I expected to kind of keep quiet a little bit? If that's the case, I would always recommend offering yourself as a service for the meeting, such as how about I volunteer to take notes and distribute them after the meeting. I mean, who's going to turn that down? I've never seen anyone turn that down ever, or 
you know, sometimes the culture is a little bit more, we need to have some back channel conversations before the meeting to make sure we're all on the same page rather than just springing things on people. And so that's, again, ask, ask what's expected of me, ask how I can show up in my best self, because just, you know, different places of the world, you'll have a, a different expectation and not assuming what your role should be or your approach should be is um, huge. Um, that's, uh, those are great insights and they apply at every point, potentially at every point in your career. If you are young, it makes sense to ask, you know, what's my role. And if you're older and, you know, it's, it can be useful to say, so I'm, I'm the leader of this team now and what's expected of leaders in this environment. How, how do good leaders run meetings or whatever? Absolutely. Um, and Deirdre, and, I'll share with mm -hmm. you too, not sorry to interrupt. It's just, I was, um, you know, I came out, I had this education, I was ready to go. I had some kind of brand name blue chip companies on my resume. So I was like, okay, great. I'm here to just do work. And, but part of the challenge for me is that I looked really young. Like, especially when I was back kind of mid twenties, you know, early thirties, I looked much younger than I was. So I wasn't doing myself any favors by showing up kind of with a, well, here's how I'm going to do it. And then when, especially when I looked a lot younger than I actually was. And so that's something too, um, just to realize, you know, what is your perception versus what you think your reality is? Ah, okay. Um, I love that. And I'm very curious, how did you, if you were expected in that um, environment you were describing in China, mm -hmm. if you were expected to go in and tell people what to do and your expectation was that you didn't know everything and you wanted them to help you decide what to do, how mm -hmm. did you make that happen? Yeah. Usually our best learning is by doing something wrong, but that's why we're having this session so that I can help accelerate that for you. And you don't have to put your foot in it as much as I did. Um, that was something that honestly, I contacted the previous expat who had held that role asking, and he had such great stuff to say to me. I said, can we have a standing meeting every week where, you know, you can help me with these things? Like, what does this term even mean? Um, you know, what's going on with these people? Because sometimes if you ask someone directly, you're not going to get a direct answer in response. You might get sort of an around the bend answer, or you might get a politically correct answer that bears no resemblance to what's actually the answer. So again, kind of presenting yourself in a more humble way and just saying, you know, here's directionally what I've got on the docket that needs to be accomplished or what the home office is expecting. But let's actually talk about you what are you seeing? What challenges are you having? Do you think this is even realistic? Is this your biggest problem? And then, you know, be willing to take that in and possibly go back to the home office and say, you know what, I think we need to rethink this project. So you always want to be seen as an advocate for the people that you're with, as opposed to kind of a tattletale or a spy from the home office. Well, I think that's super important. And then how do you advocate for people in the destination environment with the home office? I know, mm -hmm. uh, I think for international managers, sometimes that's a that's one of their principal um, challenges is, is sort of translating uh, what they're finding when they go abroad so that the home office can actually understand what they're dealing with. You know, that's such a great question because what I find often, especially in, you know, global companies is there will be centralized functions and often they are centralized in the, the home location, right? So just to give you all a real life example, when I was in Shanghai, China, um, we had a great location. It was, it was easy to get to uh, with the Metro. You could, you know, that was really not a problem. A lot of people could walk or could take the, take the Metro. Well, somebody decided that the rent was too high. I can guarantee you it wasn't the, the destination. It was somebody back in the home office who was just looking at a report and who said, oh, well, this you know rent is just arbitrarily too high. So unbeknownst to the destination, um, they started working on finding a new building that was cheaper. 
And then, well, they found a new building that was cheaper. And let me tell you why. It's because it was way the heck out of the city and it wasn't connected by to the metro at all. But again, somebody in the home office is just like, well, I found a cheaper building. So why wouldn't you want to pack up and move and, and go there? And I'm like, because your entire population will quit. And so sometimes helping the home office understand, here's what's actually happening. Here's the disconnect. Um, so that was a big one. And luckily I was able to jump in before someone in the home office just completely blew up, you know, what was going on in Shanghai. And another funny thing there, which things that you learn, right? We had a lease and it was for multiple years. Well, one day the um, local political party chief, whatever his title was, he showed up to the building and he said, um, your lease has been terminated. I'm like, what? What what do you mean? We have a we have a you know a piece of paper. We're we're all signed on this. Well, come to find out, there was an expectation that a company, especially a blue chip company, was putting some time and resource in to the local party. And we had no idea because most of the people who were in positions of leadership were expats. And so had we known that this was an expectation, we could have done something about it. Luckily, we were able to come back, put on a banquet in the party's honor, um, you know, pay homage or whatever we needed to do. And then suddenly our lease came back and it was fine. So these are things that the home office would have no idea that A was going on and B, how to navigate that. And this is something that I could help take that back and say, look, there's things that we need to do as a big company here that's kind of considered um, positive goodwill or, you know, good community service or whatever, or else we're going to find ourselves in a heap of trouble. And I mean, that was just something I had no idea would happen. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's a wonderful illustration. And in terms of um, so I'm talking a little bit more broadly here, but you gave me some examples when we talked earlier. Uh, what are some of the, you, you said that Americans prioritize sort of uh, getting right to it and sort of jumping into business or right. closing the deal or getting results as fast as possible. Right. What do other cultures value? Well, yes, I will say directness and and hyper efficiency I have found to be very um, American things. And when I was in Bangalore, I'll tell you all another story. Um, I had a driver and sometimes people hear that and they're like, ooh, you had this fancy assignment. I'm like, no, if you've ever been to Bangalore, you will realize um, that th this is a transportation community that I could not navigate at all on my own. So I had this driver every day who would pick me up and take me to the office and every day. I saw there was this road being built and it was being built by hand. I mean, there were people and they were carrying um, kind of almost like a walk looking thing on their head and it was filled with scoops of dirt. And this is how they were scooping things out and moving dirt from here to there. And I was watching this thing every day and I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, you can just get one of those big machines that just lays down the asphalt and clears everything and then we'll be done with this project, right? And my driver, who I learned so much from, he turned around and looked at me and he said, but yes, madam, what would these people do then? And it really kind of made me stop and again, learn to ask questions before just talking and then realizing, you know what? Efficiency wasn't the goal for them. It was to employ as many people as possible so that they could keep unemployment rates you know, lower and to have opportunities for people who were relatively unskilled labor. And I'm like, oh, and again, coming at that from an American mindset, it's just, Phew. and, but really thinking about what are other cultures prioritizing? I mean, for them, it wasn't efficiency. And I thought, mm -hmm. okay, this starts to make a lot more sense. We talked a little bit about the fact that sometimes it's relationships, and I think that's really important in business dealings. Do you yeah. have any good stories about that? <laughs> well, let me let me give you a, a tool that y'all can use, and then we can talk about some stories. 
So one of the things I came across was this was from Bain Consulting and it's the rapid model. And this is a decision-making model. Well, there's the D is at the end of that acronym. So rapid, it ends with the D. Well, the D is who, who gets to make the decision at the end of the day. There's the I for who gets to have input, but really there's, there's a D somewhere. So now I like to ask who has the D, who actually makes the decision versus who else is just input, because that's really helpful to understand. And it's likely not to be the person that you think it is. So again, asking questions to under, you know, to uncover where are the real channels of communication here and who do I need to make sure is in the process? Um, this, this can also apply to who's going to be evaluating you, who, who's going to be providing input into your evaluation. Again, these things might not be evident. You might think it's the home office, but it might not be. And so asking those questions, but yeah, building relationships is, is key. So when I look back at, you know, my project plan and that kind of stuff, showing up on day one and expecting that I'm going to get X, Y, Z done on, you know, day one, um, is ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. And so I, my project plan should have been, especially for the first, even two or three weeks would be setting up key meetings with people and then following up with them. And again, showing how I can add value. If I can help solve a problem right off the bat, that would be great. And then, but asking each person, what do you think success looks like in my role? How will we know at the end of, you know, three months or six months or whatever, that I've made forward progress and have helped you guys. What, what would, does that look like? And so, you know, that, how can I help solve a problem that you're currently having? Um, whatever it is that would have gone so much farther. Mm. Um, I love that. And you mentioned that there were different kinds of influence and there's also, there are people who, who different kinds of power, power mm -hmm. and influence. And then there are the people who actually get things done. Right. And in the U S I think we tend to say, well, go find the person who's actually going to make it happen. That's who you right. need to talk to. And in some places that's insulting, right? Right. And so this is again, getting the lay of the land. And again, as a, in a hyper American company, you might just be kind of told, well, go, go figure it out, go solve this problem for yourself. Just go do it. Well, you know, that's probably going to be seen as stepping on a lot of toes. And so position power is where I can just tell you that you need to do something. And I expect you to do it because you report to me, but so much of the world is not like that. And even, even here, it's not like that so much. So subtly asking again, since I meet with people now and then asking each person, who do you think would be helpful for me to speak with next? Are there people here who are the go-to people for, I mean, it can be anything from just getting a dang badge or a laptop in your destination location. You know, maybe that's, there's a secret process for that and you don't know what it is or, you know, what's the expense process? Cause it's different than it is in other locations. So you quickly, if you ask questions in a polite and a, um, an appropriate way, and you appear that you're, you're not there to torpedo somebody's job. Um, I find you, you go a lot further. I had a situation in India where my counterpart, so to speak, she was a little bit more junior, but kind of the essentially equal position. She thought I was there to torpedo her job. She really thought I was there to show up, to show her up and to make a case for why she, you know, should be let go. And I didn't find that out until at least 30, 60 days in. And I thought, what? Like, why would you have that opinion? Well, why wouldn't she have that opinion if we hadn't made some things explicit or she hadn't been involved in the decision-making process at all? And I just showed up at her desk. And so I really think back to that and should have done um, some due diligence, some more due diligence than I did about you know, how are these people that I'm, I'm working with, what do they think I'm here to do and then helping. Okay. Um, wonderful answers all. And some questions are starting to come in. I'm going to give everyone a couple more minutes to ask their questions. And one of the things that we talked about, and you are so uh, insightful about this is that 
we're all going to make mistakes by definition. Um, uh, I know Mike, Mike Kelly is here with us. I'm Mike, I'm, I know you have a long history of international business. I'm sure you've made a mistake, a few mistakes. I've made mistakes. Ty, you too, I know have made, uh, have made mistakes. So how do we sort of recover from that and keep going? What should our perspective be? Because we're, we're setting ourselves up for that when we do business internationally, right? There's, there's really no way to avoid it. So given that we can't avoid it, rather than try and go in and be perfect, how should we look at that? Well, and I've got two stories that I'll share with y'all to, to, to explain um, how I've messed up. But yeah, just you're never going to know everything, right? And even if you're not just a junior person, even if you're more senior, there's so much you're not going to know. And so I think really going in with a, a spirit of, um, you know, again, I know this much, but I know there's this much going on would be helpful. Asking questions, asking some cultural questions before you get there. Um, I had some cultural training before I went to India and, you know, it didn't cover, but maybe 5% of what I should have known. So uh, one story that happened to me in India, and then I'll give you one in China. Um, I don't remember if I shared this particular story with you, but in India, I was sent there and with the explicit purpose of hiring a whole bunch of managers for um, one of the software groups that was being transitioned from the States to Bangalore. And so, man, I showed up and I was like, I got to make quick progress on this stuff because the home office is, you know, where I'm already behind the eight ball and I haven't even gotten there yet. So one of the things that I was looking at was the actual location was again, way out in a suburb. It was really hard for candidates to get there. So I decided, well, it would be much more efficient if I held interviews at, um, you know, at a nice hotel downtown. That would be great. We could have people get there. It was much easier to get there. And then I could knock out uh, a number of interviews in a row. Sounded great to me. I didn't ask anyone else if this was a great idea. Well, let me tell you about a rumor that got started really fast when Ty was constantly in a cab to go to this hotel to meet men. And I heard about this. This I heard about this like six months later. No one gave me a heads up on this. And, you know, so I was sort of seen as the, you know, the person with not high morals in that case. And I was like, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I'm meeting people at the hotel to have interviews. Yeah. But kind of culturally, I'm realizing now as a single female meeting men in a different location, culture, it, it wasn't a good look. And I just wish someone more senior to me had said, Hey, you know, let's talk about your plan here because there's just some, some perception things that are not great. So that was one thing in India and in China, I showed up and again, I was a little more senior then, but we, it was in a, um, I had about 300 engineers I needed to recruit. And again, already behind the eight ball before I got there. So I get there and the team was really down because they had really been beaten down by you know, some of the other groups, they weren't making much progress and that kind of thing. Um, well, one thing I thought would be fun would, I would have a bell installed in the ceiling. And every time we closed a candidate, we would ring the bell and everyone would cheer and make it a big celebration. And I thought, okay, this is great. All of my other leaders I was around were also expats. So I had gone to them first and said, what do you guys think about this? They thought it was great. We're going to really generate some excitement. And so I spent one weekend prowling around Shanghai looking for a bell, and then I got someone to install it. So Monday morning comes in and I tell the team, hey, this is what we're going to do. Isn't this the world's best plan? And I didn't get quite the reception I thought, but they didn't say anything back to me. They were just like, mm, okay. So here, soon enough, we close our first candidate, no bell. So I go up to the recruiter and say, hey, what's going on? Let me walk you to the bell and we will start ringing this thing. It was four months, four months that went by before someone pulled me aside and said, hey, Ty, in China, bells are kind of a symbol of death. And so, and the actual bell that you bought came off of a, um, a temple that would be rung when people died 
or you were paying homage to an ancestor or something like that. So you've been bringing death on the team for four months. <laughs> How would you well, know that, right? It's because I didn't ask the right people. I asked other expats who were like, yeah, that sounds like super fun. Meanwhile, I'm bringing death on the team. <laughs> and so how then do you move forward knowing that mistakes like that are possible and maybe that you just made one? I mean, very, very big mistakes, right? Very, very large visually. You go back and first you acknowledge, and I screwed this up. I really put my foot in it here and apologize. I'm so sorry. That was not my intention, but I understand the implications and that couldn't have been further from what I intended, but here's what I'm going to do going forward. How about we get together and I can ask you what would be helpful in creating excitement in the team, for example, or in how could I best approach hiring a bunch of managers in a short amount of time, as opposed to coming up with my brilliant ideas that I thought were just great and, you know, implementing them on top of people. Um, so own it, show that you learned from it and that you're going to do things differently right. and then, and then do a lot of listening after that, huh? Do a lot of listening and have a sense of humor too, because we're all going to mess up. It's just life. I mean, this is what life is. It's just kind of, we, we learn from it when we move on. Um, other people will forget about these things far sooner than you will. You might really kind of beat yourself up about it and think, gosh, I've just torpedoed my entire par project or whatever. You haven't. The best thing to do is just kind of laugh about it yourself first and let other people know, no, I, I get it. I get where I messed up. So, okay. Or, you know, wasn't that funny? And then I move on. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So we have some great questions. So um, I like um, Sabrina's question about Power distance, power distance imbalances between the home office and the foreign office. So how do you navigate yeah. that? Sabrina, I will just say yes. Um, those power distances, it's it really, in a lot of ways, is much bigger than we think. And again, I've often found, in fact, I have yet to find where the um, destination location doesn't feel like they're being jerked around by a home office and because they don't have any input into these decisions or whatever they say, it's kind of disregarded. Um, and so a kind of knowing that and then being able to be an advocate and again, going back to the home office saying, Hey, did y'all realize um, this was a situation and, you know, I didn't know, and I'm just bringing this back to bring it to your attention again. What is our goal? Is that the right goal? And how can we make sure that the right people have input into this? So being an advocate for one location, providing information for another location and trying to come up with some sort of win-win solution. Um, I'll tell you in that case in China where with the lease issue, um, I had to go push back on some people really hard because again, someone was just looking, somebody in headquarters was just looking at a spreadsheet, just saying, you know, this would be cheaper somewhere else. And so I had to be um, not afraid to bring data to the table and say, yes, but these are the other factors that you're not thinking about. And, you know, what really is the problem we're trying to solve? Is this really a problem? And so I had to be, um, you know, you have to realize you might have to be the brave one to bring some information that is new or people aren't going to like it. But there's ways you can present that in a way, again, where you're being helpful and accretive to the process, as opposed to trying to be a troublemaker. But yeah, okay. Sabrina, yes, is the answer. Um, how do you suggest approaching the difficult conversations when someone assumes you are an, on an international assignment for some kind of uh, nefarious purpose like spying or um, maybe uh, causing them to lose their job or whatever. Right. And that's something like in my India example, if I had come and ask her that straight out at the beginning, she would have said, oh no, that's not what I think at all. And so again, really taking the time to build those relationships and kind of 
humble yourself and ask, how can I help support you? And then being clear on, you know, this is my mission or this is, I'm here to help out with this project and then I'm, I'm going to go back or whatever it is. So I like to be as transparent as I can, but I like to ask, like, just never stop asking. Um, that is just stuff I wish I had known sooner rather than again, maybe asking a little, but then telling a lot. Um, let's go with ask a lot and be as transparent as you can with here's what's happening. Cause I found there were a lot of misunderstandings and just sort of the telephone game that by the time a message got, you know, six people down, it had kind of gotten corrupted. And so, you know, being as transparent and as forward as you can with no, here's the situation. I'm, I'm not here to take your job. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions about how do you approach working on a team? What makes a good team? How do you do that interculturally? Well, this is another great question to ask. It might depend a little bit on where you're going. What's the makeup of the team? Um, you know, who's involved? Do they have an advocate for the team? Is it junior people? Is it senior people? Is it a mixed team? And just trying to figure out those as much as you can ahead of time. And then, you know, trying to figure out, okay, let me really ask about, about hurts and pain points and how I can help be a, a bridge to a solution would be great. You know, you might join a team that's really high functioning, which could be great, but you might be seen as, you know, something that's being thrown into the spokes that's going to cause, cause a problem. They might not think they need you, or you might go into a team that has a lot of hurt on it. You know, there's, there's things that have happened and you don't know them, um, but it, it influences the things that are, are going on present day. Um, so again, I like to show up just positive attitude when things go wrong. It's like, okay, well, that wasn't what I expected, but here's what I'm going to do differently. And I'm sorry. And here's how I can help. And what do you suggest? What would be most helpful to you? And so I just like to go in and again, be transparent and, and, not be the spy. I'm I'm not trying to get dirt on somebody. That's not my approach at all. If I feel like the home office is asking me for things that I don't feel comfortable like that, push back and say, no, that that's not really what's happening here. Actually, they need a lot of support and this isn't helpful. So don't be afraid with the home office to push back when needed. Make yourself humble and ask in your destination. And I love that. This isn't helpful because I'm if, if the bottom line is the goal and this isn't helpful, then yeah. that says it all, right? Right. And, uh, you know, so again, I like to, you have your original plan, but then I like to make adjustments to the plan. Maybe you send that out to the 10 people who you found are, are most influential in, in this circumstance or the five most or whatever, just to give periodic updates on, you know, here's what's going on. Here's how this thing might've shifted a little bit. And again, in a very helpful way, not I'm spying way so that we can keep everyone abreast of the situation and keep everybody on the same page. All right, thank you. And so Davide has a hard question. This is a hard one, get ready. Okay. Um, how do you manage a relationship with somebody who's not willing to accept a different culture? Mm. Have you ever experienced this? I'm betting you have. You know, this is the old, just difficult relationships. And I will tell you, I find them on both sides of the pond. I mean, it's, you just run into difficult relationships everywhere. Right. So as, I mean, this is kind of a sales technique, but you want to figure out what their objection is as soon as possible. And this might take some, some digging and some asking questions and meeting with somebody um, multiple times before you can figure out what is their objection. A lot of times in the destination location, they're like, I didn't ask for you. <laughs> I didn't ask for you. And you show up and you're, you know, you look like you're 12. Um, what good are you to me? Or, you know, I had someone came over last year and it was a total dud and they just went back and told bad things about us to the home office or whatever it is. So, you know, I just like to say, Hey, can we, can we start fresh here? And can we, can we both just be honest with each other? If you don't feel like you need my help, okay, where do you feel like the biggest source of pain is? How might I plug into that? Um, how would you like to be kept involved in what I'm doing? And so, you know, I think it just goes back to ask because 
you know, I ran into people all over the world and here too, that are just kind of a brick wall when you run into them and, you know, don't want to talk to you or don't want to tell you what's really going on. And so I just like to, um, as my mother always said, you know, you can win people over with kindness. And so I like to be kind and not be super frustrated and, and telegraph that on my face when things happen. I like to just stay in the, how can I help serve you um, mode? Because I'm telling you, you will win a lot more uh, by, you know, being friendly and being helpful than you will trying to hold on to something that maybe we should let go or modify. Okay. Love that one. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions about um, accommodating the party leadership in Shanghai uh, when they were requesting uh, yeah. some kind of concession. How do you do that ethically um, and ethically and also legally? Yeah. Because, you know, we're all very aware of, of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for example. Yes, this is such a question, a good question, Deirdre. And honestly, one I hadn't expected to run into. Because again, coming out of a very American point of view, mindset, and a hyper-American company, we had regular um, ethics training that you had to go through, right? And so I had all my right answers about, no, I would never do this and, and this, that, and the other. And again, I think when the home office is creating even those kinds of trainings, they need to be aware of different practices in different areas of the world. And so in China, you know, I had this discussion with other expats. I had it with the home office leadership. And I said, look, you know, you might look on a piece of paper and think this is what's happening or, you know, we, but let me tell you how it is. And this is how companies operate here. And so, yeah, I don't want to fall afoul of the foreign corrupt practices. I don't want to do something that's unethical. So how can we have a win-win here for this? Um, in our case, it felt like putting on the banquet for the local party leader. Um, we're like, okay, that seems like a, a fairly small thing. And we just kind of knew it's like, do you want to keep your lease or not? And we realized we had made a mistake in just coming and, you know, setting up shop and not asking again, not asking informally with other companies or other leaders, you know, is there anything I need to be aware of here? that would help, you know, just keep us in good graces with the, um, the local party. And I'll tell you, this is what I struggled with a lot because, you know, I, I have high belief and kind of high principles on, no, we shouldn't do these things. Well, guess what? The world is a lot less black and white than you think it is. And these are really good things you need to um, be able to discuss first and see what your approach is. But again, I had to go push back on that guy and just say, you know, you can not like it, but this is the situation. So how can we best navigate this for the, you know, for a win-win here? But I'll tell you, um, Anna and a couple of people were talking about that. It was an eye-opener for me. But really, even for me to go back to the home office and just say, hey, things aren't quite like you said, or things aren't quite like you think they are, that was really good intel for them mm -hmm. so that they could start adjusting or making a few changes here and there. Yeah. So I, I wish I had a nice, crisp answer for that one, but I'll just say it's a gray space and that's where you don't have to make the decision on your own. You should not make the decision on your own. You know, you should reach out and get some, get some help or at least enlist people to come up with a, a solution. Maybe get your legal team involved. A hundred percent. Make sure nobody is going to jail at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Love me some legal team people that you need to get in good with your attorneys. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, here's a question that I think is interesting. Can you share examples where you found that having a, a culturally diverse team was perceived as a disadvantage rather than an advantage? And what were some of the challenges involved? You know, that one's a little tricky for me because I'm thinking we are so keyed into how diversity is such a great thing in terms of every aspect of diversity, you know, age, gender, thought diversity, um, not to mention all the other kinds of diversity. So for me, it's always, I come through it a, with a lens of this is great. 
I love having so many different kinds of people um, make up the team. Now, I do certainly understand coming over into a group where, you know, in China, they're 95% Han ethnicity. Like, you know, in a, in a country of, you know, over a billion people, 95% are coming from the same ethnicity. It's really hard to kind of wrap your head around that as an American, because there is no American ethnicity. You can look like anything and be an American, right? So we just kind of have that baked in. But to realize, oh, okay, you know, they're going to have some perceptions of me, you know? Um in India, when I was talking with someone, he said, yeah, especially single women at your age, we just assume are prostitutes. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening? Now, that was probably just his opinion, not the opinion of the entire country, but that just threw me for a complete loop. And so really spending that time on helping people understand and me understanding them so that even I can help point out how are we each accretive to the team and the project in ways maybe we hadn't been explicit about before. Um, but, you know, it, it's just funny sometimes when you get into those and you you hear later what people really think of you. You're like, what? <laughs> but I always assume positive intentions. Humor goes a long way and being friendly goes a long way. Well, sometimes laughing at... Um... Ideas like that is a can, can be a powerful thing as well. If you yeah. if you really were a, a prostitute, you might not find it so amusing, right? So sometimes right. just and laughing. I just laughed off. it off, I think, and made a joke about, well, I don't have time to do this job and that job, so um, <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm here to do, and and just move on, you know, and and just try to, yeah. But a lot of talking, a lot of listening, and even just asking, you know, are there things you you wish you knew? Oh, here was another one. In when I was in Shanghai, again, I had a large team, I had about 21 direct reports. And it started to occur to me after some things happened that they really didn't have a good idea of what the company was like, kind of. And I said, okay, well, do y'all have questions about the home office or or what's going on or whatever? I mean, I really just threw it out there. And the first question they asked me was, do you have a gun? And again, just things I would, that would never occur to me in a million years, right? And I would then ask, well, I always like the, the question of, um, can you tell me more about that? And to see, you know, where this is coming from. And when you think about it, again, Chinese controlled media, by the way, all media has a bias. In the US, we have extreme media bias. You just need to understand how it's biased. But, you know, Chinese controlled media, and they were presented with the message over and over that it's just all guns in America. And, and so that's what my team was intrigued about. And that was such a, a shocker for me because that doesn't even make my radar. Um, so, you know, these kind of things just happen. And I had, again, just to kind of laugh about it and tell me, okay, you know, tell me more about that. What, what's going on there? They're like, well, we saw a TV program that, you know, showcased this. I'm like, okay, um, great. We all see TV programs and they are not real life, you know, so here's the reality of what's going on. Well, um, that's a great example. And I too have been asked that question. So um, okay, I've, but I've always thought that I had a certain Western character characteristic that sort of uh, that I seemed a little bit like Clint Eastwood, and that's where they were coming from. But maybe I need to re reassess. But dude, um, me was my Texan, my Southern accent drawl that got them, and they thought I was walking around like Yosemite Sam or something. I don't know, um, but I just thought that was such a funny, you know, impression. I love the image of you as Yosemite Sam. Yeah. Um, we could have a lot more fun. Um, however, we are actually out of time. So no. <laughs> uh, as much as I uh, would love to ask you questions for three or four more hours, I'm afraid we must end here. And um, again, thank you so very much for joining us this evening and for sharing those wonderful stories with us. And um, uh, everyone else, thank you so much for being here this evening. And um, 
Oh, we I was just going to add just... really fast because I, there was a, so many questions in there. I would love to answer your question. So if you just send me an email, I will answer your question. I'll send it back to Deirdre. So maybe we can consolidate these and, and get them back out because y'all ask so many great things. If anyone wants to stay on a little later, I can, I don't know about Deirdre, but um, shoot me an email and then you can find me on LinkedIn. That's my primary love language on socials is LinkedIn. I'm at Tyann Osborne. The good thing about having an unusual name is you can get all the URLs. At Tyann Osborne. Okay, you heard it here, everyone. I'm sure you'll hear from some people and thank you so oh, very you. much. Thank you so Greatly much. Greatly appreciate the opportunity. Bye, everyone. No better. Thanks. Bye-bye.